You are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man, in Alameda, California, right across the bay from San Francisco in the northern part of the state that I call home. I'm Ralph Tycho. It's the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And I've got a guest, my buddy, my godfather, Tony D'Angelo from Connecticut. How are you, pal? I am doing fine, Zig. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Pomford, Connecticut. And uh, spring, I think, finally has sprung. Uh, we're still supposed to get a few showers this week. Um, you know, we were told when we were small children, um, April showers bring May flowers, or as Bullwinkle the Moose said, um, rain brings pilgrims. So it's you know, one or the other. We'll be getting some rain. Yeah, you know, Bullwinkle's one of the uh, underrated philosophers of all time. <laughs> he certainly <Yeah>. was. <laughs> When you can quote Bullwinkle on a Sunday morning uh, with all the spirituality available to you in Connecticut, um, and all you can quote is Bullwinkle, I I think you're in good you're in good stead because those other people don't hold a candle to Bullwinkle. <laughs> now, you and I were talking off the air. You you were kind enough to introduce me to Bob Wolf, whom I did an interview with uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it's still um, in my head. Um, First, I'm appreciative um, so much uh, um, of the introduction. I want to thank you. But um, the point was, um, in the interview, Bob referred to working with one of the your all-time heroes, and that was Joe Garagiola. They did the Game of the Week together, and Bob was so complimentary of Joe and his work, and he referred to him as the um, the wittiest person he ever met in his life. And... Um, you know, Joe is a human being. There's controversy as to um, how he accepted Jackie Robinson back in the day. Uh, did he spike Jackie Robinson? You know, was he a product of his time? All those things. But as a professional broadcaster, um, he was he was something. So. Um, you and the, you and I in, in this business, on whatever level we're on it, in it, um, uh, have our heroes. And um, the fact that he referred to Joe, Joe as uh, in such a complimentary way, I wanted to pass that on to you because um, he was your guy, Joe Garagiola. Oh, it weren't so much baseball from from watching, you know, Mr. Garagiola as far as. Uh, just, it, it really, um, there was a lot of humor in those broadcasts, and, and the whole thing with Joe was baseball is a funny game, and it really is. It's a game where... You know, that was a, a book that he wrote early on. It is a one book of the that he wrote. baseball books I ever wrote, or, uh, ever read, not wrote, I would be coloring books if... <laughs> <laughs> not writing them in my life lifetime, and not staying within the lines, as a matter of fact. So, um, but he, it was great influence on me that there was humor in baseball. That it was, and he did in his book um, make make folks laugh and educate, and as well, if you educators should be entertainers to keep interest. You know, I I fully agree. I fully agree. Yeah. And, you know, who that brings us to, uh, one, a broadcaster who who's, um, what are we celebrating today? What, did he die? It, it, it's an ago? odd anniversary, Zig. It is the, um, our, our mutual friend um, on Facebook, John Harvey, who does a commemoration every day of passings and of birthdays. 
This is actually the 22nd anniversary of the passing of Howard Cosell. And oh, 27. I thought it was 21, but, you know. It, 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 it may be 21, yeah, and, and, and I think you're right. It, uh, I, you're right, it was 1996. And the um, I have so many memories of Howard, and I mean I probably have more than most, because if you were in the greater New York area back when Howard was doing Monday Night Football and Wide World of Sports, well, Howard also did the nightly sports report on WABC Radio, which WABC was the flagship for all top 40 radio stations in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, people from, you know, Los Angeles or Detroit or, uh, or um, Cleveland might um, dispute that, and, that, and that's all a fun debate, but... Uh, for us in New York in the pre-internet days, it was WABC, which I understand was a very strong signal. It could come all the way out to the Rockies. Something about how the waves were modulated. So many, many people listened to WABC all over the country. But Howard also did a, a, a nightly sports report, which was a, um, a one-minute report followed by a one-minute commercial followed by another one-minute conclusion. And there's very few examples of that. Uh, as far, there's a couple here and there on the Internet, and he would often come in. There was a uh, an afternoon DJ. Uh, my people from my region will remember him, Dan Ingram, who was legendary and is probably the model for just about any top 40 DJ. And he and Howard would go back and forth in some of the funniest banter you'd ever want to hear. And it was entirely off the cuff. And Howard would say to him, Dan Daru, my daughters listen to you, and I cannot understand why I have raised such wayward young ladies. And it would go <laughs> from there. And, he, and Howard did some remarkable uh, short broadcasts on the show, like I could remember when um, Sonny Liston died. And Sonny Liston is really, uh, to, to boxing historians, is, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge Liston fan. Uh, why, I don't know. I mean, the man was just this enigma curiosity, uh, you know, just, just a, um, for, for, for lack of a better term, just a, you know, probably a thug. Uh, Howard called well, him. You, you probably know, know more about it. You probably could give me an answer that I've been uh, thinking about for 50 years. The Phantom Punch. Did oh, you dear. Did championship dear, dear, dear. on a Phantom Punch? How did that come about? What are the rumors? Well, uh, you've spoken to Bob Lipsight. I've spoken to Bob Lipsight. I've asked him two different times. He was there. And I said, did you? Before I could get out, did you see it? Right at, did you? He says, I never saw it. And it's, uh, you know, he says the best that could have happened was it wasn't a phantom punch. It was a perfect punch. It just was something so swift and clean that landed so perfectly. I tend to think there was a little bit of funny business, personally. It's just my cynical side. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> you could what was going on. And what, uh, I mean, he was just a bear to get, he, no one wanted to fight him. And even Ali says, uh, or Cassius Clay at the, at the time, uh, said over the years, doesn't say it much anymore, God rest his soul, Mm -hmm. But he said that he was manic. He was just so trying to fool himself in psyching himself up before the fight that um, he just, um, you know, his, his bragg bragging and um, his way and his... Um, but he was afraid of him. <laughs> Who wouldn't be? Uh, well, was and away. there was a um, probably, and I know we've spoken about him before, the uh, the precursor of uh, talk show, sports talk show radio in um, the 1970s and uh, the 1980s 
uh, Art Russ Jr. on uh, the old uh, WNBC, and he had a, a nightly sports talk show. And Art was a uh, Art was a black man, and uh, a very sensitive uh, black man. And he would always say that Sonny Liston came to him one time and said, I'm going to tell you a story, but don't tell this story until after I die. Now, the reason why I've always kind of sort of taken this, eh, okay, maybe it's true, maybe it isn't, is um, Art Rush Jr. was really one of, uh, I won't say he was of questionable reputation, but Art made a bunch of promises he couldn't keep. But uh, and one of which was he asked uh, many, many people for $20, and he never paid them back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. coming, coming back on the canvas with that, the, um, he said Sonny Liston told him one time, uh, I'm going to tell you the story, but don't say it until after I've, I've, I'm, I'm deceased if you survive me. Um, the Muslims came to me uh, before the second fight. And said, you are to take this money and drop. It's f- f- find a way to drop somewhere in the first round. Just take the money. Uh, we know you had an off night that first night in Miami. You know, you're, you're not going to hurt the kid. You're going to take the money. So uh, he said, Art, um, I got the money in my pocket. And so I took a dive. Now, do is is that true? It it seems likely, but I you know who, who's around to prove it? Sig? Yeah. Well, one of the stories. So I'm going to tell you my Howard Cosell story. Howard Cosell. Speaking of sports, um, along with Big Ralph, number thirteen. <laughs> I used to listen right? to that. They do the pre. They do the the Mets. Uh, pre-game and after-game show. From Howard Town. The Mets were disgraceful today as Casey sits on the bench and naps. Will they ever get better? Not with that man as manager. That was <laughs> so, so I'm a kid, and we go down for autographs to to the hotels and the garden and We'd always, whatever teams we were in, we'd be down getting autographs. And um, Howard knew that my friend, the Bear, was a giant fan. And the Bear was a bear of a guy, big guy, even in high school, you know. And uh, But he was a fanatical giant fan. They had moved to San Francisco. And all the Bear's life, all every day, did you get a giant score? Did you hear what the Giants did? You know, the West Coast, three hours later, all that. Did you get a box score? Did you get this? He was fanatical. And we're down getting autographs. And um, Howard says to the bear, oh, the bear says to Howard, did, uh, did you hear, happen to hear a giant score? Because Howard's down getting interviews. He was, he had this, little two-bit show it was two-bit it was new york city and he had a sports talk show in new york um and he'd get you know little interviews and stuff on the radio wabc and um how how it says to the bear oh the giants they won today 5-1 you should be happy as a clam blah 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 or they lost it Whatever it was, he didn't know, and he just lied to the bear, and he infuriated the bear. And so we couldn't understand. We were just kids. We couldn't understand how somebody could be such a jerk <laughs> as Howard Cosell, such a, a pompous jerk. That was our impression as a kid. He was by no means. Oh, he certainly, yeah, I mean. He was a things. jerk, but he wasn't an uneducated person. He was an attorney. He wanted, yeah. yet he had a desire to do more than sports, which isn't good, believe me. to talk. If I just talked about sports on my podcast and my uh, all day, I'd be a much happier person. Oh, I know. But, uh, but 
I got to talk life. I got to talk politics. I got to talk the world as I see it every now and again. And it it's cathartic, but it doesn't. What I'm trying to say is that um, it isn't fun. And Howard had this. He's in the candy store life with sports, and he's so bright and so with it that on top of the world, he wanted to run for senator. He wanted to get in, into politics. That world is not fun. It isn't no. fun today. It wasn't fun back then. The, the horrible people that we're dealing with as our leaders, corrupt um, parties playing both sides down the middle, um, playing good cop, bad cop every four years, having systems in place that are uh, that can get um, they can get Hillary Clinton nominated um, over Bernie when Bernie really should have been the candidate and um, and produce a Trump on the other side. It's just it's crazy. And Howard wanted that. And um, he wasn't a jerk. He um, Not at all. He was very sensitive. I think his demon, I think his problem was alcohol. Down, uh, a large <laughs> part of it, you know, it's, um, and I'll tell you one of my favorite Cosell stories in a little bit, but uh, being, being from Stanford, Connecticut, I mean, the uh, the poster boy for all things good and all things right and all things sports, and not undeservedly, was, was Andy Robustelli. And Absolutely. Howard really kind of hitched a lot of his wagon to Andy Starr. And Howard and Andy and a couple of the other giants um, would, uh, Tom Landry being one as an assistant coach, would carpool into the city, and they became uh, associated with one another. I always thought they were friends. People uh, have told me confidentially who were a little older than I was in town that uh, Andy kind of uh, politely endured Howard. Uh, he found him to be an annoyance, but yet knew that Howard was favorable press, and uh, Howard knew a lot of the right people that could open doors for Andy. Uh, so Andy, uh, you know, didn't uh, not not that Andy was using him, but Andy uh, didn't uh, try very hard not to aggravate him. But uh, one of the things that I, I do understand that. Uh, Andy did say to this person whom uh, I will, uh, you know, let remain nameless, is in a press scrum when somebody was being interviewed, Howard being a, and I, and I saw him in 1988, which is another story, and said hello to him, but you were impressed with the fact that this was a very large man, not a heavy man, but a very tall man with very rangy arms and a almost pea-like head compared to this body. And Howard would take his microphone and uh, his boom microphone and would lower it right in front of the interview subject, kind of edging out everybody else in uh, the press, which is why they all hated him. And uh, Dick Young called him Howie the Shill and a bunch of other stuff. And Howard, in his booming voice, would ask questions over everyone else. So tell me, Mickey, how did you think the pitcher was throwing? And he got everybody else on the press corps aggravated. Uh, but that was what Howard, that, that was whatever you want to call it, bad Howard. Right. When Howard was bad. What was good, Howard? He had a wonderful relationship with his wife. He was incredibly yes, he loyal and um well he left that, a wonderful and, his, his and he was a great dad so um, yes he was and 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 he was a passionate jew you know a, a, a staunch defender of israel which i respect tremendously okay um, you know as do i and, uh, um the, of course being a jew myself uh i can't separate i don't think one can separate Judaism from Zionism. And I agree with um, you. I agree with so, you wholeheartedly. So, 
And that, so that someone like me, a Jew slash Zionist, can't be objective about what's going on on a day-to-day basis over there. But you know what I liked about him, Zig, was he, he held his loyalty, but yet he was kind and respectful to people of other faiths. You know, Floyd Patterson was a devout Catholic, and Howard loved Floyd, absolutely positively loved him, thought he was the dearest boy. You know, and and just uh, thought, and and Muhammad Ali, when Muhammad Ali uh, became a a Muslim. Oh, he was the first to defend, he was the first to defend Muhammad in every way. Exactly. Um, He he said, if a man wants to be called Muhammad Ali, let him be called Muhammad Ali. If he doesn't want to go to war, don't let him go to war. And he was a vet, he was an army um, veteran himself, and he saw, the, you know, a lot of times, remember, he was old school from, you know, the um, World War Two, Korea, that yeah. sort of thing, and he was ahead of his time. Uh, a lot of well, I was in the sixth were, grade, and our sixth grade teacher told us, you make sure you go home this afternoon and watch history being made, as Muhammad Ali will... Uh, reject induction into the armed services and Howard was there uh, with his microphone walking with uh, Muhammad Ali Muhammad Ali are you going to take the step the step was induction you know uh, yeah. everybody please step forward yeah the step and, forward right uh, and uh, he wasn't and uh, Muhammad wasn't answering and Muhammad Ali will you take the step and Ali looked at him and said, Yeah, Kosell, why don't you take the step? And Kosell looked at him and said, I did, Muhammad, in 1942. (laughs) (laughs) Two quick minds. If you go to YouTube and watch them banter, Kosell and and Cassius, um, Kosell, you mentioned rangy, long arms. They kind of go back and forth and spar a little bit. Um, Howard was was uh, incredible. Speaking of dandy, you said Dan, dandy Don Meredith. They had such a nice rapport. Where they did. Gifford just played the the third go between, uh, the serious analyst, and those two made it fun. It was entertaining. And well, that's the one thing, you like them, don't like them. You know, they used to throw bricks at TVs in bars when he was on, but that meant they were watching, and that meant patrons were coming in to throw the bricks. Well, so and where I think it is, Howard the media was, has to entertain it. and um, just to bring in the listenership. And he was very bright and very astute in his analyzation of, of sports. Um, I thought he looked, Where, I, I, I said, o- over alcohol, and um, that happens with people. People have demons. People, um, his, his wife passed away first, if I remember, and I don't think he broke his heart the same after, after that. Yeah, yeah. right. And, and where I say he was a, a, a proud Jew, he was so respectful of, of others, and he never, ever, ever, you know, today you, you go to Facebook and people don't have discussions, they just vilify. Howard, you know, was, was himself and was inherent in himself, but yet was so, like you mentioned, Dandy, who was, a, you know, presumably a Southern Baptist. They got along great. Right, you know, and you can see that on the year. I understand that wasn't the case in uh, in future years, uh, as uh, Dandy and, and Gifford started to feel that they were the package, and Howard needed to go. Uh, you know, Howard chronicled that in one of his books. Right, Howard didn't have respect for an athlete analyzer, um, 
Yeah, you know, call it the jockocracy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yet, uh, as we know, there are a lot of athletes that um, I'll tell you who today. If you want to talk local New York um, analyzation, the Met television team of Hernandez and Darling and Gary Cohen is terrific. Yet the Met radio team is equally terrific. Um, Josh and Howie. So um, there's some great talent out there. Just uh, had to throw that out. You know who my one of my favorites was when I was a kid was Al De Regattas. Oh yeah, he he did um, one of the first color guys. As Bob Wolf told me, he says back in his day there were a guy would do the game. You didn't have a well, color guy. And, I, I um, think on YouTube, it's like uh, a 1934 game where uh, the broadcaster is broadcasting the game. I think it's a 1934 Tigers game. And then he's uh, getting his megaphone and he's announcing the hitters. And it's like uh, you shrug your shoulders and say, well, big deal. He's announcing the game. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And um, – but I think the first analyzer that was just hired for pure analyzation was De Regattas. And, and he could really break up plays and dissect them. And Yeah, absolutely. Certain. And I'm wondering, because I talked about this with someone on another show, and they didn't remember it. Do you remember that Ali Sherman had a local uh, yes, he TV did. show on Tuesday he or Wednesday did. nights? Um, yes, he did. He'd bring... Players on. Channel 11 in New York, yes. With a chalkboard. Um, yes. And break down plays and uh, kind of explain. I'm like, you know, 14 years old and uh, football's intricate. Baseball is totally different. Football's intricate. More of a t- baseball's an individual sport where players come together as a team. Football's a a team sport where players do individual things. And um, Ali Sherman had a way of uh, breaking things down. We were blessed in New York with... with uh, we really were. Personalities, um, not only talent, but um, athletes. Gifford was a former player, for instance. He had a TV gig that turned way before... Uh, Monday Night Football, uh, Kyle Rote, uh, all these guys. Um, like I said before, Branco, um, Ralph Branco, who passed away um, within the last year or so as well. Never, we never did get to get get together with him, did we? Oh, he. As I told you, he always scared me. I mean, because yeah. how many times? I don't, as as questions? someone who asks questions, what could you ask a guy like that that hasn't been asked? That's a. Um, and, and, that's know, how I felt. Very, uh, he would come on WFAN in New York, like in recent years, and he was a listener, and he would chat, and uh, he would be interviewed, and you'd still get a few uh, old Giant fans razzing him, and uh, he 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 would go back at him, and it was. Uh, Really, something to, but it's like, what, what? I mean, how many ways can you ask him? Gee, Mister Branca, you think you would have thrown another pitch if you had the chance? I mean, it's like, you know, that's funny. That's what Sal Magley asked him. He, he, Branca would complain for years. He would complain about, and then, and righteously so, because I think it's pretty common. And I'm a Giant fan. It's pretty common knowledge. They knew what pitches were coming. You still have to hit the ball, this, that, and the other. Right. And I remember Magley, uh, a quote, uh, Branca was complaining was, blah, 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 this, that, and the other thing, and I knew what was coming, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Magley says, why don't you throw a curveball, they go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Carl Erskine was so funny. He and Clem Labine was telling us we're warming up in the bullpen. And they would throw a pitch, and then they'd stop and watch. Well, uh, at um, 
one point, um, I'm You're sorry, can, can you bear with me for just a second? Okay, no problem. I'll sing. How about that? You wouldn't want that. No. Okay. Well, I'm bearing with with. I hope you're okay. How about you just coughing or something? You know what we should do? We should. Uh, take you're not going to believe this. I mean, I'm sitting here in Pomford, Connecticut, on a Sunday, and uh, an older fellow comes and he knocks on the door and asks me if I have Model A stuff for sale. I don't even think my grandfather had a Model A. Well, but anyway, this is a, anyway. This guy's uh, this is coming to your wife. <laughs> this is a prospector out there looking for model A's. Um, but uh, anyway, so uh, I don't. But to I tell you uh, the rest of the story, getting back to yeah. um, Carl Erskine, um, he's um, he's pitching. Uh, actually, he's in the bullpen. Clem Labine is watching. And uh, the uh, Newcomb's being lifted, and uh, the uh, Jake Pittler, the pitching coach, picks up the phone in the bullpen and dresses and says, okay, now who's throwing better? And the pitchers are warming up. And he says, well, they both look good. Uh, but uh, the uh, – oh, wait a minute. Uh, Erskine just dropped a curveball. He says, well, fine, give me Branca. And Erskine uh, told Bob Lazari and I, he said, you know, fellas, that's the best curveball I ever threw in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's just, just how how fate uh, takes you to, you know, where things are. But uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. And I apologize for the interruption entirely. Well, let's just let the punishment fit the crime. <laughs> Tony, how about that? I apologize for the Tony, the Tom, Tony, Tom, Tony, Tony. Uh, Tony, I this is you know, terrific as usual, to... talking ball, well, talking life with you. And, and typically I do this from my Howard. studio in the back, but I just figured, oh, it's a Sunday. I'll just sit out in the living room on the nice soft couch, and this old coot comes here. I shouldn't talk about old coots being one myself. Oh, no, and not to an old coot. Don't say old coot to an old coot. Oh, my Lord. Anyway. But All right, Tony. You're terrific. I love having you. Talking ball is well, I, I have a Howard great story memories of New York leave. and New York broadcasters. Um, can't getting back to I'm, – I'm sorry, I didn't mean Getting to back to it. I wanted to tell you that I was thinking about how my network and my show has evolved. And I think what we try to do is what a kind of a co combination – of Long John Neville, Gene Shepard, those two, and um, and Dick Shap. Yeah, uh, who, who had a, witch a column of genre. folks on, uh, a panel of folks on, who would just talk and share memories and share ideas and talk about an idea, talk about an era of a time. And how heavily I've been influenced by having grown up in New York and been a radio nut. A key, TV came second to radio in terms of getting games, of listening to games, of transistors in our ears at night. That Ali Liston fight was heard by me with my little transistor radio under the pillow so they couldn't hear me because I had to be in bed by 8.30. It wouldn't matter if it were World, I World War III coming. I listened on my parents' clock radio, yes. Yeah. You know, and and, oh, yeah, the, the radio over the, uh, over the refrigerator in the kitchen, uh, listening to Ranger games, Nick games, with my arms draped around the re refrigerator and it, and all that, that sounds a little weird, but... Um, that's, well, that's... and uh, the amazing thing was, you know, speaking of that same genre, I was uh, 
On the interstate yesterday, uh, heading uh, in from New Haven, I was down in New Haven yesterday afternoon. I was heading back east. And believe it or not, who's still on the radio in New York, um, and this goes back to the WOR days, is Joan Hamburg, who would do the food show. And she oh. was on talking about restaurants, and then, and you know, I mean, she's a lovely lady. She must be 175 years old. Right. <laughs> And she's still eating. Got to give her credit. Yeah, she's still eating. Um, I mean, she was back in the days of, you know, Pajine Fitzgerald and Peter Lynn Hayes and Mary Healy and Arlene Francis. And, yes. <laughs> yes. Arlene Francis from What's My Line. Yeah, exactly. She was an yeah. exclusive Arlene woman. Arlene she was from married. Boston, yeah. Wasn't she married to Hart or, or uh, Rogers and Hart? One of the. Uh, I think ah, she was. she was married, I believe. Was it Martin Gable, I believe? Oh, okay. Right. And well, Martin Gable was Benedict New York Benedict debutantes Parker. who did nothing but walk around in beautiful gowns and go go to dinners yeah. and uh, and just chat and uh, make us all while we uh, worked and told and waited for our place, as uh, Richard Corey used to say. All right, my friend. Um, we'll do it again real soon. And, oh, um, for sure. I just have one Cosell memory for you. Please. And this is uh, back when he was doing his one-minute radio show, you know, in uh, the uh, 1970s, in the 1960s and 1970s. My friend had called me up, and this is, I was, I think I was a sophomore in high school, and saying that Sonny Liston had passed on. And I said, oh, that's terrible. He says, well, listen to Howard Cosell. He's going to have an update at 7 o'clock. So... Howard comes on talking about the career of this recalcitrant thug and um, God's gift to, uh, you know, literacy and culture and boxing. And then he ends the broadcast by saying, and I'll never forget this, Sonny Liston of uncertain birth year, suspect education and questionable association died today in Las Vegas, Nevada under mysterious circumstances. I know of no requiem for this particular heavyweight. I'll be back in 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> no requiem. With that, he summed this whole man's career up in like a minute. It was magnificent. His whole uh, life. Oh, that's uh, anyway, great, Howard. I, I, I've taken up enough of your morning. So <laughs> oh, no. You, Hopefully you, you can divert can take now. Up all of my mornings. It's your afternoon. See, that's one thing about talking from coast to coast with these time changes. Um, it's your afternoon, morning. My morning is fleeting. Your afternoon will be with you for the rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph Tycho, for that gibberish. And we'll end it by... <laughs> Once again, saying that rain being, brings pilgrims. <laughs> All right. I know. I'll embarrass you one more time. I always end my segments by asking my guest and the whole audience to keep your dreams wet, keep your humor dry, keep your kids and grandkids at a military recruiting stations and off the laps of clerics that wear dresses. Just to be on the safe side, everybody. We'll catch you next week. And, uh, Thanks again, Tony, for being my buddy. Thanks for the opportunity. You have a great morning, Zig. Thank you. All right, man. Bye now.